1973, a massive fire tore through an archive building that held the personnel files of American soldiers and sailors dating from before World War I to the earliest months of Vietnam. Just shy of 20 million files were destroyed in a few hours of conflagration. The situation created a bureaucratic nightmare for the Department of Veteran Affairs, the veterans whom they served, and their families and dependents, as each veteran had to re-establish proof of their service and the various entitlements they had earned. Less urgent of a loss, but hardly easier to swallow, was the sheer massive amount of historical record that had been lost. At the time, most minds were on the winding down of the Vietnam War. The veterans of World War II were in their middle ages and had many good years left to look forward to. So, for most, the role those documents could have played in the documentation of American history was undervalued. It would be the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the World War II veterans who would someday go off to college and write the authoritative texts on the subject. They would be the ones that would truly appreciate what was lost on that single night in 1973. That would be, of course, once they learned of the fire itself. But there was more that was lost. Something only a handful of investigators would ever learn of. There were secret files carefully hidden away. The veterans who traveled the world would see many things. Not just the horrors of war, or the wonder of exotic lands, but things they could not explain. Things that nobody could explain. Things that the clerks would archive and record, and then learn to fear. They would document the supernatural. There was precedence for this kind of thing in the annals of history, quietly shushed up and locked away behind strong doors. Yet never before had it been recorded on such a scale. So it was all collected and stored and hidden in the hopes that someday somebody might understand it. Then it was all lost. Our mission is to simply recover what we can. The cause of the fire was never determined. The testimony of First Sergeant Thomas Caprico, retired, United States Marine Corps. I guess my first real memory of the whole experience was all the rain. In New Zealand, I guess, when we were still getting ready. Boot training had been an ugly blur. So was the special training. The ships were just a sweaty, stinking mess. So was Tahiti. And then, before I knew it, I was in New Zealand. Not that I had any real idea where that was at the time. It was just another island in the ocean to me. But there was little time to rest. Just enough to think about the future. That was when I really started noticing all the rain. There was a whole season for it in that part of the world, they told me. A rainy season and a dry season. Go figure. And then they found something to do with us. The stevedores loaded up the ships in the rain, and we boarded in the rain. And the ships were a sweaty, stinking mess. And so you go out on the deck for a little fresh air. In the rain. We were just a day or two out from landing when the rain finally stopped and the clouds lifted a little. It seemed like the whole goddamn navy was out looking for a fight. Only time I saw it bigger was at Saipan. We could smell the stink of that shithole island before we even saw the tops of the peaks sticking up over the horizon. And let me tell you, brother, the mountains of Guadalcanal aren't small. That's something folks back home don't realize. They think of tropical islands as some sort of paradise. Trader Vicks meets Robinson Crusoe. Maybe a little treasure island in the Grand Bahama is thrown in. That's because the only time they spend on tropical islands is in resorts. They don't realize how well manicured those resorts are. By the time they finish sleeping in, all the servants have picked up all the damn coconuts. Tourists don't know about the rot. That's what happens when you're not paying a fellow to clean up all the coconuts at dawn. They sit and go soft and rot and stink up the place. Of course, that brings the coconut crabs up onto the shore, and they only make it worse. Sometimes they'll tear each other apart, and they'll end up rotting in the sun, too. Stinking worse than the worst rotting fish. Then there's all the mud. Ever turn over an old rain barrel and it's just been sitting there for years? Probably a foot of gunk sitting under that stagnant, slimy water? Nothing to do but rot and, I don't know, ferment down there? Then it's suddenly exposed to the air, and you can almost watch it turn black. Smell hits you like a brick so bad it makes you want to throw up right there. Well, that's what the jungle was like. 
Every time your boot squelches up from the mud, it kicks up that smell. Everything just dies and rots and turns into the mud. I think it's probably all the goddamn rain. Compiler's note. The double chain of Solomon Islands, of which Guadalcanal is a single example, is among both the rainiest places on Earth and the most cloud-covered. It rivals the Pacific Northwest from Washington State, the coast of British Columbia and southern Alaska, exceeding it greatly in daily average temperature. Well, I could tell you about the landing. Alligator Creek. Edson's Ridge. I don't think that's why I'm here, though. Plenty of other men told you about that, I'm sure. Battles were bigger than us, even considering, I suppose. Now, I guess I should mention I was put in with Carlson. On his long raid, you know? That was important to what happened later. Most of the 1st Division was already looking at getting rotated out for R&R. &R. Not me. Guess I was special. Well, I know I was. Only reason I'm talking to you is because I don't get malaria. Well, I do, just not like everybody else. Ever have malaria? No? Remember when you were a kid and you were homesick in bed with the flu? And for three or four hours you felt so weak and bad you couldn't do anything but lie there and suffer? Now imagine that, except it lasts four or five days. And instead of being a kid, you're a healthy young man. I saw malaria take down the biggest, toughest bastards I'd ever seen. Turn them weak as kittens. I've seen green men come to the island and think the victims are exaggerating. Or they'll just tough it out. Nope. Don't work that way. If you're lucky, you start feeling better. If not, they ship you back to Wellington or Pearl or someplace and you're sick for weeks. The unlucky ones just don't make it at all. Well, I guess I must have been the luckiest mug on the island. If you can call it luck. I started feeling low one afternoon. CO sent me back to the infirmary. I was at Cactus Field at the time, so it wasn't a long hike. Felt like a 20-mile march, though. I sit down, and the doc looks at me and tells me I've got it. Except by the time they've got a bed for me, I'm feeling right as rain again. I'm back in my trench by dusk. I guess the doc made a note, because a few weeks later, they're telling me I got a winning ticket for an immune system, and they're asking me to volunteer for the raid. I guess the raid's famous enough. We were in our regular outfit, working deep in the jungle, well behind enemy lines. Guerrilla tactics, living off the land, or what we could loot. Killing the Japanese and making as much trouble as we could. Well, we make it back a couple of months later. Would have been December, I guess. We lost under 20 men. Took out about 500 Japanese, so I'd call that a victory. Despite how hard it was. At any rate, I came back and I was still in pretty good shape. Most of the others had various stages of malaria. Malnutrition, exhaustion. Don't get me wrong, I was a beanpole myself, but I'd been luckier than most. I guess that's why the brass took me aside and asked me to volunteer for the next mission. The testimony of Johnny Kiki Istaban, Haniera council member and former jungle guide embedded with the USMC, as recorded by Joseph Spector, ethnographer. Compiler's Notes U.S. forces were quick to leave many of their bases and outposts in the South Pacific at the end of the war, and the subsequent budgetary drawdowns. While many Solomon Islanders were sad to see all the business go, many were happy with the massive infrastructure the Allies had left in place in only a few short years. Scholars would only later return to these once again remote islands to study the effects that the war had, particularly with regards to the cargo cult and Johnny Frum phenomena. We could find no record of Joseph Spector, or any record of him as an ethnographer. It is possible other records he left were destroyed in the fire, and he was not an ethnographer but an American spy. It would have made good cover if he were following up on Caprico's testimony, and explains why this interview was included in this file. Well, my grandfather was the first to greet the white men to our village. Not the island, of course, but just our little village on the north coast. My grandfather remembers him as kind, He'd been a missionary, so I suppose that makes sense. And more importantly, he was a square dealer, so we all got along with him. We liked him, and I guess he liked the island because he spent the rest of his life here. His oldest boy would open up the coconut plantation. That's where I became a foreman and learned English. Well, things were a lot different when the Japanese showed up. They were mean, you know. We didn't need to wait before they started beating us in order to figure that out. We knew slavers when we saw them even though we didn't know the difference between Japanese and Koreans at the time. 
You could just see them by the way they made these poor Korean slaves work in the sun, building that airfield. Of course, most of us younger men had bullseyes on our backs, so we fled into the bush. I didn't tell my American mates, but that was when I first really learned proper jungle craft. It had only been a few months before the Americans showed up. And I'll be honest, most of us were pretty glad to see them. They were after the Japanese, and they knew we could help them find them. The Japanese, that is. We were already squatting in the bush anyways, and the Americans had plenty of food, so we were much better off when they showed up. We both had the same goals. I remember when they taught me to fire one of their big M1 rifles. Never felt more excited. Well, I shouldn't say I enjoyed those years. It was bad times. We lost a lot of good boys, both ours and theirs. There were some good times, though, and I was sorry to see my American mates go when it was over. Some of us still get some letters, though. Seems like less and less every year. Sure, I remember Tommy C. He was on that last mission, the one with the monster. We went too far. He was a corporal back then, though, didn't you know? I wasn't close with him, but when you're in the bush that long with a fella, you're going to get to know anybody pretty well. That reminds me of my grandfather again. With that mission. I should have listened to him. He'd always warned me. I'm sure you already know this as an ethnographer, but there are plenty of different tribes on Istabu. Guadalcanal, I mean. Hundreds. We didn't always get along. The ones along the coast, even the south coast, tend to get along well enough. We live much the same. You can get in your boat and row where you like, and any people you see will be happy to trade more often than not. The tribes deep in the mountains, though, they're a breed apart. Or so I always heard from my grandfather. They were not like us. Their ways were different, and they never, ever wanted us to come into their lands, or there would be serious violence. I always believed that part. He always told us they were in the thralls of monsters and demons. I believe that was just his way of scaring us. Our grandfather was always telling us stories, you know. He was kind of full of it, you know. With the war come and the Japanese to fight, I didn't care about any tribes. Besides, we had big old M1s. What were they going to do about it? Well, well. From the log of Boatswain's mate, Otto Pfefferman, SMS Albatross, 1895. Compiler's note. This log was found in the same file, apparently having been placed there before the fire. A stamp and several hand-scrawled notes indicate it was taken from a similar German archive in Berlin in 1945, or the immediate post-war period. How it came into U.S. hands as Berlin was liberated by the Soviets is not currently known. August 7th. I'm of two minds about the situation. At heart, I'm a sailor, and I do love the sea. That said, I do enjoy getting off the ship and really stretching my legs. It's nice to be on land for at least a little while. That said, I'm starting to regret coming on this mission. There's little to enjoy on this excursion inland. There's only rain, sharp rocks, roots which will trip you up when you least expect it, poisonous spiders and vermin, and the rot of decaying coconuts. I heard tell that the Spaniard who found these islands named them after wise, rich King Solomon. For when he got back home, he told the Spanish king or queen or whichever it was that the islands were rich with jewels. I haven't seen any. Makes me wonder how much things have changed in the last hundreds of years. That Spaniard sailed the seas for lands to declare in the name of King and Christ. Here we are doing largely the same, except we've got this baron who styles himself a geologist, all in the name of Emperor King Franz Joseph. The only difference is we're doing it by making soundings of the channels, and recording the weather, and collecting mineral samples up here in these damn mountains. What is the baron looking for? Gems? Good luck. I hear there's an island full of tin and another full of phosphorus to the south and east. But what good is that? A sailor like me would never see a penny. I should not be too hard on the Baron. He seems like a good enough man, if a little soft for hard work. It's my nerves, I suppose. We had enough problems recruiting scouts. The ones from Tulagi made sense. There's little reason to take scouts to islands they're not home to because they don't know the island and the locals won't like them any more than they like us. But the ones here on Guadalcanal? I don't understand why it was so hard to recruit from them. Especially the further inland we got. 
Based on the reactions on their faces, they seem superstitious. Laszlo thinks they're afraid of cannibal tribes. I've heard that one before, so I don't know if I believe it. Either way, I'm finding it hard to relax. The testimony of First Sergeant Thomas Caprico, retired, United States Marine Corps. I never had any idea what the top brass was thinking. It was always a mystery. One day you might think they're all geniuses, and the next you think they haven't got a single clue rattling around in their empty heads. They were sort of like gods working in mysterious ways. Long-term, deep-penetration jungle warfare is a dangerous game. Carlson's raiders worked because we knew what we were doing and we did it right. And even then we got pretty lucky. It very easily could have been a disaster. The Japanese made that mistake. They'd sent whole battalions into the jungle in the hope that pure strength of will would pull them through. Most of them would never come out. And not just because of how many we killed at Edson's Ridge. I heard the Japanese nickname that place Starvation Island. And I believe it. Jungles look lush, but when it comes to food, they may as well be a barren wasteland. Maybe if you're lucky, you can come across a ripe breadfruit tree and feed a platoon for a day. But that never really happens. Any marine recruit can march 20 miles a day down a country road. But the best of us made it only five in that bush. And if you get malaria, good luck, buddy. You're not walking out of there. And nobody else will be strong enough to carry you. Not unless your whole company bivouacs for a few days and has plenty of fresh water or stretchers on hand. And we usually don't. I'm getting ahead of myself. Apparently Top Brass was worried that the Japanese were going to heavily reinforce their positions on the western end of the north coast. At this point in the campaign, it all came down to shipping and logistics. Whichever side could put the most men on the island and keep them regularly fed would be the side that won. It turns out the Japanese had realized they'd lost. They'd evacuate in January, February. Right under our noses, too. I guess that gives you an idea of how rough our intelligence boys had it during those months. They probably changed the codes we'd broken or something. At any rate, High Command was coming up with a plan to send large units of men way, way out into the jungle on a huge flanking maneuver. Take the Japanese in the rear by surprise. Well, we all thought it was the stupidest thing we'd ever heard. And most of us have been talking about how well the jungle raids have been going so far. Then again, maybe the brass had the same hesitations we did. Because, before that, they were going to do a lot of recon. Send a couple companies of us deep into the mountains. Look for good supply drop sites. Natural corridors that might make transportation a little easier. Freshwater springs, or maybe some of those breadfruit trees. Maybe if we got really, really lucky, we could have pulled off a major offensive. Unlikely as it would be. But we'd never know until we looked. So we traded in our rifles for carbines cut our regular ammunition supplies in half, and made up the difference in extra rations, water, and quinine. Then every two men would carry a bamboo pole, maybe eight feet long, and the third would carry the canvas to make a stretcher. Just in case. The Testimony of Johnny Kiki Sure, I remember that day going into the bush. Seemed like a damn fool idea to me, but they never listened to us. The muckety-mucks on top, I mean. The captain listened. Good man, but he had his orders, too. At least he was in charge of it all and made reasonable decisions. Two companies. Seven 20-man platoons in one, eight in the other. Tough types who knew what they were in for. We'd worked out the general plan ahead of time. They had those Aracobras. You know, the ones with the big cannons on front. Well, they'd taken plenty of pictures over the whole island, so... By that time, we had some pretty good maps. The two companies went into the jungle together, but later we'd split up. Go around mountains and meet up on the other side. Debrief about which way had been better. Can't tell that from airplane photos. So we ended up making better maps as we went, testing things out. You know, good, solid organization. Sometimes the companies would see each other for a day or three, but we'd all agreed on a meeting place beforehand. Usually a nice big clearing of kune grass on the side of a mountain. Easy to find each other, but easy to take cover too, if we were Japanese planes overhead. As we started getting used to it, we got better at it, and we divided up into individual platoons for smaller obstacles. Ridges, river fords, ravines. I don't think my company spent more than a night apart. I guess that's why we all started getting pretty nervous when Sergeant Belair's platoon didn't show up at the reconnoiter spot that one night. 
from the log of Boatswain's mate, Otto Pfefferman, SMS Albatross, 1895. They've taken Fernando. It's still four hours before dawn, and I think we're all terrified. We were awoken by the sound of screaming outside our tents, and when we searched, we found Fernando gone and his tent torn. Uh, there was a trail of blood leading down the mountains, though it's off the foot trail and it's too dark to follow. We're still high up the mountain, way up on the lion's head, up above the trees. The Baron collected his samples, and we were going to perform the main descent in the morning after sunrise. I think maybe they saw our campfires and expected us defenseless. It must have been the interior tribes. It's the only explanation. The guides are scared as well, since now there's been bloodshed, and there will likely be fighting before we can get out of their territory. The guides have been chattering away in their language, and only some of it they're translating. I wonder what they know about these people. Why would they kidnap Fernando? As far as we can tell, they've stolen none of his belongings or any other item from the camp. I can only hope they mean to ransom him to us, perhaps later. Maybe they'll parlay under sunshine. There was a lot of blood, so clearly he's hurt badly. The Baron is cursing and muttering to himself. I can't understand his German, either. We've all armed ourselves. Some of the men seem more interested in revenge than finding solace for Fernando. Their hackles are up. Perhaps they fear him already dead. We are all alert, and it will be a long wait until morning twilight. It will take us two days, perhaps more, to get back to the ships if we make most haste. I feel exposed up here. I should smother my light. The testimony of First Sergeant Thomas Caprico, retired, United States Marine Corps. Yeah, 2nd Platoon, bravo, they didn't meet us at the rendezvous. It was a weird sort of pendulum of emotions. First, we think they're just running late, ran into more quicksand or mangrove roots than we did. Then we started getting really worried about them. Then we think they're even more late, and they're going to have one hell of a story to tell. Lieutenant gets them all lost, or some shit like that. Then it's time to head out to meet up with Alpha Company, or we'd be late too. That's when we really started getting worried, trying to fight the jungle and your fears at the same time. We just couldn't imagine what might have happened to them. Our guide, John, his biggest fear after malaria or broken ankles was some of the tribesmen this deep in the island. They hadn't had contact with Americans, or maybe they'd run into the Japanese. At either rate, John expected them to be real mean. Though he also said that he hadn't been that worried about it. We all had carbines, after all. That's what I couldn't figure out. If they'd run into some sort of violence, a Japanese recon team, some hostile tribe, we should have heard their gunfire, right? We weren't that far apart. Unless they'd gotten lost where the jungle swallowed up more sound than I expected. I remember thinking that the jungle had literally swallowed them. So yeah, I suppose most of us had figured they'd gotten lost. Lieutenant Small said they all had contingency plans if that happened. Head back to Henderson. There's something else I think civilians haven't wrapped their minds around either. Just how big Guadalcanal was. They heard we were all just fighting back and forth over an airfield. So they picture a little island with an airfield, something out of Hollywood or picture books. Well, the fighting was just on a little patch on the north side. The island itself, though, was big, like a hundred miles long. Some of the mountains went up over 7,000 feet. Still, even if you got lost, you should just be able to go in one direction, more or less, for a few days and find the coast. Even during that march to the next reconnoiter, we were still expecting to run into them again and hear a hell of a story back at the field. Well, we got to the next reconnoiter with Alpha Company. Should have been all of us. It was intact, but it looked like their first platoon had been through some serious shit. It did nothing to calm moods. The Testimony of Johnny Kiki First platoon was present, but they weren't intact. Several of their men had gone missing, and that didn't make any damn sense. It wasn't supposed to happen. They'd go behind a tree to take a shit or some damn thing, and they wouldn't come back out out of view for a second, and people would vanish. We couldn't believe it, because you always clump together. You're never out of voice range, especially in the bush. Sure, any of us could fall victim to a stealth Japanese infiltration unit. That was basically their specialty, but they don't just make people disappear. There was always screams, sounds, often from the Japanese themselves. There's blood. A trail, at least. All of us were used to that, and yet 
every one of the men from that platoon swore it wasn't the Japanese. And you couldn't just look them in the eye and pretend they were lying. These were hard men, and I've never seen the type to look so scared. Not in that way. The captain decided to scrap the mission. Some of us just didn't get it. Except for the lost platoon from Bravo, which we were still sure had just lost their way and were getting their bearings. We were still suffering acceptable losses. We'd all known the mission was dangerous. There were suggestions the captain was yellow. That led to arguments. Not that any of us were getting insubordinate, but there were just a lot of aspersions about the captain's character getting thrown around, and it wasn't helping. We didn't need to fight, and it just delayed our return to Cactus. I don't know if anybody died because of it, but what was really nagging at me was that it was already starting to get dark by the time we started back. I remember there were a lot of arguments about which route to take back. We had reason to believe that 1st Platoon Alpha had found the quickest, easiest route. Except none of those men who'd taken that path were willing to go back. And they meant it. From the log of Boatswain's mate, Otto Pfefferman, SMS Albatross, 1895. I'm back aboard the Albatross. The Baron is dead. Laszlo and Kristoff are dead. We left Dominic behind when we fled. He was hurt, and I fear he's dead now, too. And others. It came after nightfall. I thought it was tribesmen at first, but there was only one, and it was no man. Our guns were useless. It stayed in the shadows. It, it moved too fast, and we couldn't see it until it pounced. It was small, but terribly strong. It ripped off limbs. At first, I thought it was killing for sport, but no. It was feeding as it killed, too. They are forming a new party now. The, the first mate, that is. They mean to go out on a rescue mission. Or, or to give the dead a Christian burial. I heard a man say, revenge. As if he means to fight the natives. I think they don't believe us. I refuse to go out again. I, I won't let them make me. This island is hell. And that thing... Is the devil. The testimony of First Sergeant Thomas Caprico, retired, United States Marine Corps. I guess if I had to call it a name, I'd call it a vampire. It hit us all after dark. Whole company was stretched out, basically single file. Pitch black, deep jungle. We were used to having the Japanese have all the same difficulties in night fighting that we had, but we didn't count on a superior predator. It was a textbook ambush. I was near the front when it attacked the rear. I guess we'd stretched out half a mile. We saw the muzzle flash reflecting off the underside of the canopy. It gave us just enough time to hope it was lightning. Before we heard the gunfire. And the screaming. On reflex, most of us started heading back to support the defense. What we didn't know was that it was just moving up the line toward the front faster than we were moving back. Then we started seeing men running for their lives. Running our way. Absolute panic. Total confusion. A couple of men fired flares. For a few seconds, we got to see what the jungle really looked like. But in this weird, monotone orange. It only made the shadows darker. And those shadows moved as the flares arced down. You know, at first, I thought it was just killing for the sake of killing. Except it was stopping to feed. Just a few seconds at a time, but I guess that was all it needed. Then it was near me. Somebody tossed an incendiary grenade. I don't know why. I guess it was panic. It set something else on fire. It might have been one of the men. Point is, there was this bright glare of burning phosphorus. And more light from the flames. I got a good look at it. He was ripping a man to shreds. I unloaded all 15 rounds of my magazine into it, almost point blank. I say into it, but I didn't see any holes. Sure, it was only a 30 cal carbine, but something told me my 30 odd 6 wouldn't have done any better. You ever see a fat man after a starvation diet? We had a few chubby majors on that island, but they ended up as skinny as the rest of us. They lose the fat faster than the skin can adjust, and you end up with these flaps of extra skin. That was sort of what this thing reminded me of. Like maybe a long time ago it was... What's the term? 
morbidly obese. Then it shrank to this frail, five-foot, eighty-pound monster. But the skin remained the same, hanging off its bones and sheets. Maybe it had gone through cycles over and over again. I guess that's why I'd call it a vampire, for want of a better word. When I emptied my magazine... No. After it finished eating that man, it, it looked back at me over its shoulder. With all that skin hanging off its arm, it sort of reminded me of Bela Lugosi and his cape. You know, from that movie? Anyway, I just ran. The Testimony of Johnny Kiki We ran out of that forest and into a hill covered with kune grass. It made it easier to run, even if it was uphill. I remember how happy I was to see the clouds had blown away and the moon was out. We gathered together at the top of a ridge. It seemed like it was the closest thing to a defensible ground. We all waited, ready to fire, as the last of the stragglers came out of the tree line. Too few. There wasn't any more violence out in the clearing that night. Some men noticed it stayed out of the light. Some of these started thinking it was hurt by the light. I don't know if I believe that very much. I think it just preferred to strike from the shadows. What happened was, we just tried to produce as much light as possible. Set up a perimeter. Every flare incendiary. Sometimes we removed the lifting charges out of the flares and burned the stuff at ground level. We started a bonfire out of dead grass and fronds. We started making torches. The whole damn island probably saw us. Probably too loggy too. Made ourselves a hell of a target for the Japanese. And that thing out in the dark. But it didn't attack, and the men credited all the light we'd made. Thing was, the Japanese didn't attack either. I think they both just weren't interested in attacking that particular night. We all felt better when dawn came. Bone-colored clouds, hazy because we were all exhausted and scared. Before we set off, a flight of sky trains flew low over the ridge, dropped us supplies. I guess the boys back at Cactus thought that's what we needed with that big light show. It was all they could do to help anyways. We tore the capsules apart for more flares, anything we could set on fire, even bandages and alcohol from the medical kits. Mostly what we got was potted meat, Hershey bars, and ammunition. 30-06. What a snafu. The hike back out of the bush was like a fever dream. We were setting fire to anything that would burn. A lot of men took to shouting, singing, firing off their carbines like loud noises would drive it off. Like an animal. It didn't come back, but I think we just got lucky. Early evening, we met up with a new scout unit sent out to bring us back in. They had lots of fresh water and stretchers and medicine, on account of them knowing something was wrong, but they didn't know what. We tried to tell them, but they just looked at us like we were crazy. There were no more attacks. We made it back to Cactus Airfield. At first, we tried to explain, but we learned to shut up real fast. Now, all these years later, you're here to finally debrief me. I guess that's army bureaucracy for you. Oh. And 2nd Platoon? Bravo Company? Yeah, they never made it out of the bush. Compiler's Notes Caprico and Kiki mentioned a captain and Lieutenant Smalls. They and other officers in the expedition should have filed reports, but none can be found. It is unknown why the then-corporal would write the only report though perhaps he was the highest-ranking man to make it back. As for Caprico himself, there is little on record. He had seen more than enough service to go home, not even counting this last misadventure. He'd be awarded two Purple Hearts, a Bronze Star, and apparently a promotion, though he'd not see combat again. A careful reader will note he suggests presence at the invasion of Saipan, though that contradicts known records. Perhaps he meant seeing photos and film reels of the invasion fleet. He was discharged in March of 1943, shortly after disembarking in San Francisco. There he'd re-enter civilian life and die in 1975 of cirrhosis. Johnny Kiki would enter local politics and serve his community for decades. Other than this interview, it's not known if he told anybody about these events. 
Later in life, he became a guide and MC for elderly American GIs, returning to see the island once more. And he raised multiple large donations for several of the island's small museums. His exact age was not known, but he died peacefully in his sleep in 2002, believed to be well into his 90s. It is not known what happened to Pfefferman, or how his journal ended up in the ruins of Berlin in 1945. What is known is that the Austro-Hungarian survey ship, SMS Albatross, put into San Francisco Harbor later in 1945. The story of the massacre of Guadalcanal would make the front pages of newspapers and tabloids all across the country. Most notably, thanks to W.R. Hearst and his New York Journal. They would play up the attack as being at the hands of savage cannibals. It is not known who invented that cover story, but Hearst would have loved its salaciousness. This story, and others like it, would stick in the American collective imagination, and form the antiquated caricature of the Melanesian cannibal prancing around an absurd cauldron as white captives are boiled alive. For a while, the name Guadalcanal was on the lips of Americans everywhere, only to be quickly forgotten. It would come roaring back into the American consciousness some 47 years later, and with a vengeance. The United States had a hands-off, laissez-faire policy with many, though certainly not all, of the islands that it occupied during the war. There would be an intertribal civil war started in 1999, casualties in the tens of thousands. It garnered little international attention. Outside of World War II popular documentaries and films, America essentially forgot about it a second time. It reappeared in American news in 2022. The People's Republic of China had suddenly become greatly interested in the island, and began plying the little government with gifts and attention and promises of deals they couldn't refuse. The conventional wisdom was that China was trying to project its power into a region that the West had been neglecting. In lieu of the rediscovery of these files, that assessment should be reinvestigated. They may have other motives. As for our own interest and involvement in the affair, a new marine recon team is being assembled and prepared at this moment. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zwall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakado, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blarian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Gary Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Windy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves Noy Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brooke, The White Stag, Corey Connection, No Name, Marta Carr, Professor Elm, Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders and the Archivist, Rob Smith, Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, D Master 311, Britt the Alchemist, Taylor the Fox, Holly Howarth, Julia McWilliam, Lily Pad, Serena and Jesse, Diego Rodriguez, OCL Perez, Wolfcat 128, Kamisha Coffin, Jen Scott, Avanza, Lucian Haran Allen, Hunter Nystrom, Tyson Harris, Ricky Monroe, Jess Gaming, Mastiff Nomad, James Lowe, Alabama Nana, Jessica Hunt, Kelly Savory, Chris Zamora, Dave, E.L., Michelle Angel Wolf, Linda Allison, Indica Jane, and Kara Cali. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you get access to bonus videos and content, as well as a Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and I'll see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.